Hey, uh, John McMullen, 973ESPN.com. He's got a plethora of good reading right now up on the website, 973ESPN.com, including talking about Doug Peterson, the coaches collapse examining Peterson's role in the Eagles' loss. John's a good piece and uh, getting a lot of reaction. Uh, I think, uh, you know, when you look at this game and you ask the question, why did the Eagles lose? You could give me 10 reasons and you could probably make a case for a lot of them, but what ca- what reason is top on your list? Well, top on my list is they took their foot off the gas. It really was. They had that game won. Uh, they outplayed the Cowboys. I, I think they were content uh, with a 10-point lead, thinking that would hold up. Uh, and obviously it didn't work out. And uh, we all know revisionist history. We could have done this. We could have done that. But, uh, you know, the real key point to me was third and seven at the Cowboys' 30 with about seven minutes to go. And that was that weird sort of arcing pattern to Darren Sproles that lost six yards. And then all of a sudden, you know, the way Caleb Sturgis is kicking 48 yards is a gimme. Uh, and then Doug's thinking, uh, do I want to take a 54-yard field goal and risk giving the Cowboys a tremendous field position and trying to tie up the game? He decided to punt. Donnie Jones does his job. Uh, but the Cowboys respond and go 90 yards. So, you know, it's hard to say that's what cost them the game because when you do let a team go 90 yards, there's obviously some of this Some of this has to be on the shoulders of the defense, uh, and we all understand that. But when you're playing in the NFL, you, you it's Herm Edwards' rules. You play to win the game. You don't get conservative. You don't go Dean Smith, four corners offense. And that's what I think the Eagles did too much of. Um, yeah, because <laughs> – There's so many ways we could go with even that answer right there. The play that he runs to uh, Sproles, they elect not to kick the field goal. Did you like Peterson's reasoning as to why they decided not to do it? Yeah, I mean, I don't have a problem. Once you lose that six yards and you look at where you are in the football game, the defense had been playing pretty well. Uh, You had taken Dallas out of, of their identity which is obviously running the football. They became, they became a pass-first team. So I don't have a problem going with Donnie Jones. And as I said, Donnie did his job. He pinned the Cowboys back. So you're making them go on a long field. You're making them go 90 yards. Uh, but the bottom line is they did. <laughs> and so that's going to be questioned because Caleb had to obviously kick the 55-yarder at the end of the first half. So he obviously had the capability of hitting it. Uh, And if you make that field goal, it's a two-score game. Game's probably over. Uh, But he erred on the side of caution. And that's where I say in the NFL, it's a really fine line. And sometimes you got to try to go out and win the game. On the road, though, in a hostile environment, he decided to play it cautiously and obviously came back to bite him. All right, so he said today he watched the game over and there's only one play that looking back on that he would change. Is is If you watch that game over, are there other areas where you probably would have done something different? Oh, there's, there's a ton of areas. One, I, I think as we get – As we get more film on Carson Wentz, it's becoming abundantly clear to opposing defenses that Doug is trying to protect him with these short, quick throws, uh, with these run-pass options that really don't have uh, uh, another uh, sort of complexity to the play that stretches the field. And as that becomes more and more of a trend, you're going to see opposing defensive backfields sit on routes. Uh, and that's why we always talk about taking shots down the field, even if they don't work, because you have to loosen up the opposing defense. You have to put it in their mind that I, I can't just jump every route because maybe there's going to be a double move uh, and maybe I'm going to get caught on that. Now, part of that is the receivers are awful. We all understand that. But that doesn't mean you completely take it off the table and as I wrote on another piece in 973ESPN.com, if you look at the numbers, Carson Wentz 
Uh, only quarterback in the NFL over the past two le- weeks that hasn't completed a pass that has gone over 20 yards in the air. So that kind of tells you this team is just not stretching the football. He's 0 for 4, so he's not like he's 0 for 20. They are just not throwing the football down the field. So to look at the film and say there's nothing I would have done differently, come on. I I mean, obviously, hindsight being 2020, there's got to be a lot of things you would have done differently. (laughs) And, John, what did you take away from Doug's? uh, Because that was brought up, uh, throwing the ball deep with Doug today. And he tried to go right to the Kansas City excuse, like, well, we did it in Kansas City and had success. Is he uh, living in a dream world? Well, I, I don't I don't think it's necessarily that. I mean, a lot of it's coach speak when he says there's nothing uh, you would have done differently. Uh, behind closed doors, I imagine he has a different mentality. And I understand all of that. Uh, so I, I'm not really concerned. I always say, you know, Chip Kelly never lost a press conference. (laughs) So the fact that that Doug doesn't win some and he doesn't come up with a a witty remark or a quip that gets everyone chuckling or laughing, uh, that kind of stuff doesn't concern me. What concerns me is what's going on between uh, the lines. And I, I don't think he needs to be as cautious as he has been. I understand it in week one because nobody knew what to expect with Carson Wentz. And I understand him being very, very cautious and trying to build up his confidence and and calling safe plays. But now that we're through seven games and we understand the kid's mental makeup, you you don't have to play with the kid gloves. You, you You can let him throw the football down the field a little more, let him stretch, give him more on his plate. And I think everybody agrees with that. How about Nelson Aguilar and his comments after the game about drops? Uh, Do you think Doug knew about that before today's press conference? Uh, Because it looked like he was taken by surprise a little bit by that question. And does he make a change there? Well, he should. (laughs) I don't know if he was familiar with the comments uh, because they're just so ridiculous from Nelson's standpoint. It was obviously just frustration. I mean, the kid, he, he's a good kid. He's just, he's just not playing well. Uh, and that, that drop in, in, the, in the red zone was just egregious. I mean, that's, a, that's an easy first down. That's a perfectly placed football. And he just drops it again. Uh, and to be upset that people are going to ask you about it, uh, I mean, that's just being – that's not being a professional. You know it's going to come up. But the problem is it comes up every week with Nelson, and that's where the frustration comes into it. He's just been a, a – tremendously inconsistent receiver. He's been unproductive. Uh, And the only reason he's out on the field is because the Eagles don't have another option. Josh Huff can't run routes. Uh, Bryce Treggs is, you know, picked up off the waiver wire. So unless there's a trade by tomorrow's deadline at 4 p.m., you have to play Nelson. And that's not good because right now he's not an NFL level starting receiver. He's probably, and not probably, he's not He's not a four or five on 90% of the teams in the NFL, and that's that's harsh reality considering he was a first-round pick. And another play or another sequence that people are scratching their heads over on this Monday after the Eagles lost, uh, the decision to insert Wendell Smallwood. Did you agree with that at that time, and, and did, or would you have liked to have seen Smallwood come in and get his carries earlier? Yeah, I mean, it's weird that you get your first carry in that spot. So from that standpoint, uh, it's a little strange. Uh, But that said, hey, you can't fumble the football. And and that's pretty much what fueled the Cowboys' comeback, at least the start of it, uh, was that fumble. So uh, would I have liked to have seen him get a touch or two earlier in the game? Yeah. Uh, But when you're a Wendell Smallwood and you're trying to – uh, garner more playing time, and you want the football more. You have to do with the most. You have to do the most with the small amount of touches you can. And obviously, he did not do that. And that's one I can't really point at Doug and say that was a, a, a poor decision because that's the way they've been using him to this point. Very, very few touches. And I think his mentality was, let's get 
the fresh legs in the game late against a tired Cowboys defense and maybe Wendell could get something going and we can run out this clock or run it down significantly. And obviously it didn't work out at all. No, uh, a couple other things. I mean, there's a a laundry list of things here. Um, No timeout with the the final, you know, 15, 20 seconds there. No, he's saying, well, I optimal uh, (laughs) confidence that we were going to win that game in overtime, but, don't you have a pretty good special teams block punt, miss uh, snap, punt return? I mean, what's he thinking there? Yeah, I mean, I think he's thinking, uh, let's just get it to overtime. It's very unlikely that any of those things are going to happen. Uh, and the last thing you want is it's something going the other direction, uh, maybe a fumble of that nature. And I disagree with that because Darren Sproles is uh, a veteran player one of the best punt returners in this league for a long time. So, yeah, I mean, if if it were up to me, I'd give him every chance possible. Uh, and if there was any opportunity for him to return that, I, I would have hoped lightning would strike. Uh, and, and, yeah, that's another one I disagree with, Doug. But uh, I don't think it was terribly, terribly poor decision-making. I, I just think it was one of those where – People can see both sides of the coin, and and because of the player and who it was, Sproles, I think you got to let him try. Yeah, it goes to what he said today. He, you know, his one thing that he would have changed. He said, "I would have accepted the penalty in the running into the kicker, and then gone for it on fourth down." And to me, of all the things that he did wrong, that was one I didn't really <laughs> have that big of a problem with, really. But it goes to. You know, the aggressiveness that he kind of talked about last night. He said, what did I take from this game? Well, I got to be more aggressive. That's something I kind of pride myself in. And, you know, if you're going to be aggressive, okay, aggressive. Go after the punt. Take a chance. You know, give your team a shot. Uh, He said today, you know, we're going to need to go 35 yards in 15 seconds. Well, let's see if you could do it. That, that to me, was puzzling. Uh, Let's flip the defense real fast. I don't know why Dallas got away from Elliott because I thought he was just outstanding in the game, both in the past game. They're going to have their hands full with this kid for the next couple of years. Uh, But what did you think of Schwartz's defense last night? Yeah, I mean, I I thought it was a weird dichotomy because I I wrote about that on today's pigskin.com. And I thought, you know, Scott Linehan, obviously the Cowboys play caller, Jim Swartz, have an extensive history. He, Scott was uh, Swartz's offensive coordinator uh, in Detroit. Uh, and I, I think early in the game, I think I think Swartz got exactly what he wanted. I, I think Linehan was a little freaked out because he kind of understood that Jim knows him and knows what he wants to do. And that got Scott Linehan out of, of what the Cowboys do best. And that's what you mentioned, Mike, is run the football. Uh, and, and by the way, Zeke was running it really, really well early. And for some reason, they wanted to throw the football. And I, I think it was because Scott Linehan was a little, little leery of Jim Swartz. And the interesting thing about it, though, is I think the Eagles got exactly what they wanted. Uh, and they still lost the football game. And that's a testament to, to Dak Prescott. It really is because, as I said, if one rookie doesn't get you, the other one will because the Eagles got exactly what they wanted defensively and couldn't close it uh, because Dak made enough throws to beat them. How do you think, John, the D-line did on their pressure? Because I, we saw a lot of Brandon Graham and, and a blink of Marcus Smith, but how do you think the D-line did overall? with their pressure? I think Brandon was off the charts and nobody else did all that much with the exception of, of, as you mentioned, Marcus Smith earlier in the game. Uh, And, and I do think he deserves credit for, for giving that line some juice because Connor Barwin has not been playing well. I think Fletcher Cox understandably uh, was sort of a wash against Zach Martin. Those are two of the best players in football at their particular position. So that's a great one-on-one matchup. And I don't think either dominated the other. Uh, but it hurt from the Eagles' standpoint because you had Brandon Graham really dominating off one edge, yet there was no push in the middle. Uh, so Dak could step up easily, get away from Brandon. And when Connor was out there, there was nothing from the other side. And I think that's where the problems came 
Uh, and that's where that Benny Logan injury was very, very important in this game because there was no interior push by and large. And where where some of those Brandon Graham rushes would have created sacks or hurries or bad throws, they didn't because nobody else was doing their job. A lot to uh, dissect on this one. John's got a bunch at 97.3 ESPN. Dot com is uh, I want to get your take, too, on the usage of Sproles. Now, over the years that Sproles has been here, many times we would be here on a Monday saying they got to use Sproles more. And he ran 15 times for 86 yards. Um, he also caught the ball a couple more times. But can they realistically use him that much the rest of the way? I mean, is this going to be his role moving forward? Or is this just a game where Doug said, I'm going all out to try to get this game tonight, and touching, uh, giving Sproles more touches is the way to do it. Yeah, I think it's more the latter of you said there, because I, I think Doug knows he can't do it, do it every week. Uh, and if you do, uh, Darren's going to get banged up at some point. It's just his body. He's not a big guy. Um, and it, it's not, obviously, he's very compact. He's very short, but he's 33 years old, and he doesn't have a history of, of of being a bell cow back in this league because of his body type, and that's just the reality of the situation. But I think the Eagles were looking at it last night as this is a very important game against a division rival in first place on the road. Uh, if you win, you're in first place. You jump over them. Uh, so his mentality was let's put our best players on the field. And Darren, to his credit, that was his best rushing game since, I think, 2011. So he performed at, at a tremendously high level. Uh, but, yeah, I don't think you can continue that moving forward. And if you do, if that's your plan, you're probably going to have to realize you, if you do want to ride him like that, it might last till week 10, week 11, week 12. It's probably not going to last to week 17. Uh, good game for Sproles. The other running backs, Matthews, four touches. Uh, Barner, three. Smallwood, one costly one with a fumble. For oh, more on this game, <laughs> for more on this game, 97.3 ESPN.com. John's quick hits from last night. Uh, also a piece regarding Doug Peterson's role uh, in the game and also uh, a, a great story about Carson Wentz. You want to check that out at our website, 97.3 ESPN.com. Dot com. Thanks, John. Hey, thanks, guys. John. Happy Halloween.